So thank you again for coming to our third Zoom event of the Film and Lecture series for the fall 2020 um, semester. Um, tonight, we are having a post-viewing discussion and presentation of the film American Factory. And tonight's event is part of International Education Week, which is a joint initiative of the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Department of Education as part of our efforts to promote programs that prepare Americans for a global environment and attract future leaders from abroad to study, learn, and exchange experiences. So there are activities, a lot of virtual activities going on um, throughout campus this week and throughout the country on college campuses. American Factory, the film that perhaps um, hopefully you watched before this, is a 2019 American documentary film about a Chinese company named Fuyo in Ohio that occupied a shuttered General Motors plant. Um, it won an Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. Our guest speaker for the evening, it's, I'm proud to introduce Dr. Kyle Koble. We're so thankful to have him with us. He's an associate professor of marketing at Lindenwood University. His research focuses on the otherization in consumers' minds and the steps that creativity can take to bridge these gaps. Originally from Union, Missouri, he graduated from St. Louis University in 2012 with a PhD in international business and marketing. Dr. Koble teaches international marketing, consumer behavior, social media marketing, and marketing management. Professor Koble works as a faculty mentor, is on in his words, frankly, a ridiculous number of committees, which many of us understand. Um, and he used to present and attend conferences when we did that sort of thing. Um, his papers include titles like New Nationalism Online and the Future of International and the Historical Baggage of Managers and Coworkers' Homelands, the Preference of Other Nationals. And he participates in organizing Lindenwood's open RPG sessions for faculty and students alike. Um, at home, Dr. Koble has an old beagle named Pete, who is becoming incontinent, unfortunately. And he has beautiful children who are way too involved in Harry Potter and the Rick Riordan universe. So join me in welcoming um, Dr. Koble, who has a presentation for us, and then we'll open up the floor for conversation. Great. Thank you again. So what, how I'm envisioning right now, I'm going to go through and show you uh, some of my thoughts and how they relate to international business and international marketing from this particular film. Uh, from there, after we pull out a few of these themes, I thought maybe we could have a, a question and answer session. Does that work for everyone? Okay. All right. So let me go ahead and, and share my screen here. <laughs> Do, 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 do. No, that's not the right screen. Let's try that one again. Forget me. again here. Let's see. Lee, are you seeing the slides? I'm seeing the slides. Do you want to oh, wonderful. just hit okay, from great. beginning? Yeah, no, that'll okay. work then. Uh, I was hoping that would that would be what would occur. All right. Let's move this up here. Okay. So as uh, uh, Professor Kolb mentioned, um, I, I'm from Lindenwood University uh, and uh, I am an associate professor of marketing here. I do teach in international marketing, so I try to combine these, both the international business and marketing um, academics here on this. So, so if you have questions as we go along, please let me know. All right, so I wanna cover first some just gigantic ethical disasters in the global business here. Um, I think that'll help put the film in context because there was a lot going on here ethically that was, I mean, frankly suspect. And, and I know that uh, 
if you've ever worked in, in labor or management, uh, you know that there are a number of things that you, you simply cannot do that, that were done um, and were done quite openly in this film. But I want to put some of this also, like I said, into context. So the first step I'm going to tell you about is a rather disastrous problem that Coca-Cola had in Colombia in the mid-90s. Now, Coca-Cola had an issue here where they had labor union organizers coming into their plants. Now, as Cope maintains, they, these were independent bottling facilities. Therefore, it wasn't technically Coca-Cola that was involved. So let me lay out what exactly happened. This uh, uh, labor union or, uh, organizer, Isidoro Segodo Gil, um, was organizing uh, uh, Colombian workers in a bottling uh, plant uh, in Colombia when the, some of the uh, uh, far-right militias in Colombia came in and it asked to uh, see him in the lobby of the bottling uh, plant. Uh, when he came out, they opened fire and killed him. All of the employees in the bottling plant then had to file past his body, which was left in the, in the uh, lobby, and then were asked individually if they wanted to continue to remain a member of the union or not. Not surprisingly, every single employee gladly turned in their union card. Now, what happened uh, was a few of them did mention this uh, and did uh, contact international labor boards. It blew up really in the, in the 90s and we had this whole killer Coke idea uh, where we saw massive protests outside the company headquarters in Atlanta. What happened was this brought some pressure to bear on Coca-Cola where they started to distance themselves financially as well from some of the people that they had been doing business with. Um, at the same time, we still see uh, uh, no one who is prosecuted for these murders. This is uh, uh, one thing that I like to highlight because sometimes people think that uh, sometimes American companies aren't the ones always uh, uh, doing some of these things that are wrong. Um, Coke really has their hands fairly dirty on this. Also about the same time, we have Royal Dutch Shell. And Royal Dutch Shell, you know, we always hear about uh, um, energy companies and some of the uh, perhaps suspect things that are they get up to in the Middle East or with the environment. This was an environmental disaster in the Niger River Delta in Nigeria. Um, regardless of your opinion on whether or not pipelines are a good thing, um, Royal Dutch Shell decided to build a pipeline through this uh, uh, delta. And because there was not uh, really a strong activist community uh, in this uh, area, they built the pipeline as cheaply as they possibly could. It was openly spurting oil um, and really ruined the farmland of the Ogani people. What they didn't suspect at the time was that the Ogani people had a, ma uh, actually it was a, uh, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, uh, Ken Sarawiwa, uh, who was living in New York at the time. He came back to Nigeria and started advocating for the Ogani people. While he was in Paris, some uh, murders occurred in, on the land. When he arrived, he was arrested for committing those murders. That happened while he was in Paris. Uh, he was quickly tried and executed. From after his execution, uh, Royal Dutch Shell received worldwide condemnation. And you might say, well, why is Shell getting involved when it was the government who was doing this? Well, it turns out that the gov uh, Royal Dutch Shell was providing small arms and military support to the Nigerian government. I always mention to my classes that 
any time uh, you start providing small arms to a government and finding yourself in the uh, arms business when that is not your business, you probably need to take a good hard look at your ethical stances. Number three, now this goes back uh, to the mid 80s, uh, the Bhopal disaster in India. Uh, one of the worst, if not the worst, uh, uh, industrial accident in the world. What happened here, also an American business, Union Carbide, which was later bought out by Dow Chemical. Uh, Union Carbide was using a skeleton crew uh, as they wound down uh, operations in Bhopal, India. Uh, they were trying to relocate to Kenya, which had much laxer environmental standards. Now, it turns out that some of the chemicals that were being used uh, were quite dangerous, and they leaked out of the plant, uh, which was un unseen by the supervisory committee, excuse me, the supervisory uh, employees, who, again, were operating on a skeleton crew uh, with decaying infrastructure. Unfortunately, uh, this produced a, a haze of poisonous chemicals that went over a city and killed thousands of people. Um, Union Carbide, um, the executives in Union Carbide stayed in the United States for the rest of their lives. The last one has just recently passed away um, while India tried to extradite them for capital offenses. Um, they hid in the U.S. essentially uh, to keep them from uh, 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 standing trial, uh, as India wanted them to do, from murder. Two more. I know this is super cheery, right? The Rana Plaza disaster in Bangladesh is a much more recent uh, uh, disaster. Many of you may remember this. Um, this only occurred in uh, uh, 2014. Uh, this was really the largest garment industry uh, disaster that we have. We had a building in Bangladesh that was officially zoned for, I believe it was two floors, but an additional 10 floors were built on top of it. Um, again, you can imagine the house that is supposed to be two story and then you just keep building floors what would happen. Over a thousand workers were killed as it, was, as it uh, uh, collapsed in on itself. And it turns out that a number of very popular brands, uh, including J. Crew, uh, United Colors of Bennington, uh, uh, and H&M, uh, 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 were being produced in this particular facility. Um, they found these brands uh, Again, these were companies that were supposedly uh, kept a very hard stance on human rights, and it was uh, viewed as, as well, false. Uh, it was a major problem for these brands. These brands then had uh, uh, worked into a number of different uh, uh, funds uh, that are currently active trying to maintain uh, well, Bangladeshi conditions in the uh, apparel field. Last one, and one that I think might have a little bit more bearing on what we're talking about today. Christmas lights and Christmas cards that are being made by political prisoners in China. So, this is, here is one note uh, right here that was found by a girl from uh, in a uh, Tesco in I think 2017. It says, we are foreign prisoners in Shanghai Qingpo prison China, forced to work against our will. Please help us and notify human rights organization. Uh, numerous uh, uh, other notes have been discovered in people's Christmas lights and, and uh, uh, other uh, Christmas decorations. This seems to be a common practice uh, that's being used in political prisoner camps within China. Um, it's really called into question uh, uh, where most of these lights and Christmas ornaments are actually being made. At the same time, it does not seem to be putting pressure on retailers to look into their supply chains. So it's, uh, this is still very much an ongoing issue.
Okay. Why did I share this to you? Just to make you feel horrible, right? No, I, the reason why we're going through all this is because I want to tell you that what Fuya has done, while, let's say problematic, uh, uh, I think problematic would be probably the charitable person uh, uh, description. Uh, I ha could easily see you moving into the despicable. Uh, this is unfortunately not atypical um, and would barely rise to noteworthy given some of the other issues that companies engage in that we see massive loss of life, uh, uh, liberty, and property. Um, I want you to keep this in the context here. Now, I'm not trying to excuse anything that Fuya has done. I'm just trying to say that we see a lot of really appalling ethical lapses on, on major scales do in global business. And please keep that in mind as we're moving forward here. Again, not excusing what Fuya has done, but it, it's unfortunately not like they're the this horrible actor here on the stage uh, that has dirty hands and everyone else has it is a shining example of light here. Okay. Why are we doing international business at all? What's, what is this purpose? Because this seems exploitative, right? I want to go over just a, some of the basis uh, theory. I know, super exciting, right? Uh, some of the basis theory for why globalization has even started to occur. Um, so I'm gonna go through this super quick because I realize it's not, you know, super exciting stuff. Let's talk about advanced international business theory. Yeah, right? Okay. So uh, first up, we're gonna just skip right over Adam Smith. Most of the stuff was very revolutionary and most of the stuff was wrong. So uh, we're gonna get instead to uh, David Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage. And this was one of the first theories that really does a great job explaining why we trade internationally. And I think it has bearing on the Fuyao stuff here because the whole idea is if China can make glass cheaply, why don't they? Why, are, why is this plant in Ohio even existing in the first place? It's a little more complicated and we can start to explain this by Ricardo's uh, comparative advantage theory. Now, if you see in the graphic here, you can look at the hours of work needed to produce one unit. And under this idea, gosh, Portugal is just better at everything than England. So why on earth would Portugal and England trade? Well, it's a matter of degree here. Portugal's a lot better at producing wine, and only a little bit better than producing cloth. And so if you look at who can produce the most in, in, in the most efficient way possible, it really makes sense that Portugal would produce the wine because they're much better at it than England and have England produce the cloth because they're only a little bit worse than Portugal. And so it's much more efficient for everybody involved if then Portugal trades wine to England and England trades cloth to Portugal. Everyone becomes better off under this particular system. Now, why am I talking about this when we could be talking about Fuyao? Well, it's a little bit similar. One of the things they can come back to again and again here is, oh gosh, the Americans are screwing this up. They're not doing this correctly. Why would we, why, why aren't they just producing it all in China and sending it over here? Well, there's a trade advantage for them to do this. You still have to move on on this. And let me present a couple more things just to kind of bring this particular point up because this theory doesn't exist in a vacuum. Okay, to really get into this, we also have to talk about Barney's resource-based view of the firm. Now, you can see on here the idea of the VRIO, the idea that certain uh, um, uh, resources become valuable, rare, inimitable, and organized uh, around a particular company. 
And the whole idea is that if it can be all of these things, you can have sustainable competitive advantage. The idea of where this fits into global business is firms are trying to seek out these particular resources. These resources can be physical, they can be people, they can be just ac general access to markets. One of the things Fuyao is trying to do right here is that they're trying to get close to Detroit. They're trying to get close to the American car scene. And that's an advantage that other Chinese companies don't have. That's one of the things they really don't highlight uh, uh, in the film. But they're, they're there to try to get an advantage over some of the other uh, uh, Chinese glass manufacturers. Williamson's Transaction Cost Economics. This is actually a Nobel Prize winning, or excuse me, a, a Nobel Memorial Prize winning uh, uh, topic. Uh, the idea that every time we do, we trade, we encounter transaction costs because I'm trying to get something from you, you're trying to get something from me. And that our generalized goal, one that explains things when we're talking about international business, is we're trying to reduce transaction costs. Let me explain. So it would make sense if Fuyao stayed in China and just sold their glass. Why do they have to open an Ohio plant in the first place? Why can't another plant just deal with an, uh, importing the things in? Well, if someone else was importing Fuyao's glass, there would be additional costs in the supply chain. So even with everything that we see, all of the problems that Fuyao has uh, in Ohio, it's still cheaper for them to do this because they're eliminating additional transaction costs that would occur in an international supply chain. Also, on a side note, they're going to incur more costs than normal because glass is not a terribly a wonderful thing to ship uh, uh, <laughs> by container ship. Um, we've already seen in the film uh, a lot of piles of glass, and I, I would has be really hesitant to open up one of these containers after it goes from Shanghai to Long Beach. All right, this is my favorite one right here, and this one, it, it I, I know you don't see a lot uh, on this. You're looking at this, you're going state aspects, change aspects. Oh my God, when we shut up, let me let me explain this though, because this is a wonderful Swedish theory called internationalization theory that has one of the best terms ever, the term psychic distance. I know it, it, it's not from the X-Men and it's way less cool than it sounds. But when we start talking about this, it fits so well with this whole film. If I had to pick any, any one of these slides that would just really explain this film, it would be this one. And let me tell you why. So psychic distance is your comfort with the other, someone who is not like you. And everything that we figure into when we're talking about psychic distance, you know, from the culture that we're in, the food that you eat, the way that you dress, the way that you interact with people, the deference you give authority, all of this contributes to the closeness. Now, when we look at psychic distance, we see some countries that tend to have very low, or excuse me, uh, uh, um, very close psychic distance to us. So of all the countries in the world, I, I wanna ask you all, what country do you think is closest to the United States, closest to our personal comfort level in psychic distance? Anyone have a guess? You can always press the space bar if, uh, uh, if you want to toss in on this. I'll give you a hint. It's definitely not China. Canada? Canada is really close, but you know who screws it up for Canada? The Quebecois. All those people up in Montreal and Quebec City, 
ruin the averages for the rest of Canada. So if we're talking about your average Ontario resident, no, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. It's the French Canadians. It's Anyone always the way. The, the country that's really the closest to us is actually Australia. Australia has one of the closest uh, um, uh, 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 psychic distance scores to us. Canada is really close. The United Kingdom is really close. Uh, Ireland and New Zealand are not that far away either. Really, when we get into any country that's English speaking, the next closest country is Germany, actually. When we start moving away, we start seeing uh, uh, places that seem more and more foreign to us. And that's, that makes perfect sense. The more foreign the country is, the higher our psychic distance between us is. And in the bottom quartile of countries, that's where we find China. They're not the bottom, but they're pretty far away. Here's why this matters to this particular theory. The whole idea here is that if I'm committed to a, a country, I go in, I would choose a country normally based on how close I feel. But sometimes I will end up in a country where I feel very foreign. If I end up in a country where I feel very foreign, the more I'm committed to that country, typically the higher my market knowledge grows. The more my market knowledge grows of that particular country, the more comfortable I start to feel in that country and the higher my commitment goes. The Swedes found this uh, a very interesting idea here when they looked at this, they said, economically it made perfect sense for all these Swedish companies initially to go into Germany, West Germany at the time. But all the Swedish companies instead first went into Denmark. And Denmark's a small country. It doesn't make a lot of sense for these Swedish companies to go into but it feels very Swedish to the Swedes. So they all went there first. And when they went into another country, they, they were very tentative about it. And they had to wait until the management team felt at home in these countries to really start to build up. In them. Now, I'm also using terms like getting into a foreign market. And I realize that probably not everyone's super big into uh, international business. So let me just give you a little bit of explanation on that too. There are lots of ways we can go into a foreign market. Um, I'm just gonna touch on three of them that have bearing on this film. Exporting is what uh, um, everyone gets a pat on the back for. You know, if you're a manufacturer here, your goal is to export, to get stuff out. Uh, the U.S. government typically will support you if you want to export things, right? You're creating jobs at home. Good job. Keep exporting, sending things out there. That's a great thing. Contract manufacturing, everyone gets mad at you for. Contract manufacturing is, well, gosh, we like having products at home, but we just don't like making them here. What if we made them someplace cheap and then brought them back? Okay, now everyone's mad at you because you outsourced all the jobs to get cheap stuff. Fuyao isn't doing any of this, okay? Fuyao is doing something called foreign direct investment. Now, foreign direct investment sounds like a great deal from, for the Chinese, but it's actually a pretty good deal for the uh, Americans. What, what's happening here? is that they had the option to either go through acquisition or something called greenfield investment. And they went in and they decided to do greenfield investment. They decided to build a factory from the ground up, or in this case, the shell of an old G factory, or it's G, GM factory. And the idea here is that they're building stuff in a foreign country, it's true, but they're not sending it back to China. They're selling it in that foreign country. And so it's a good deal for the Chinese from a PR standpoint, but also for the Americans because they're making major investments in uh, uh, the United States. Now, here's where things get a little bit murkier. Foreign governments love foreign direct investment. 
And the United States is no exception. You saw in the beginning how everyone's just falling over themselves excited in this film, right? Oh my gosh, Fuyao moved in. We're all gonna have super great jobs at $11 an hour. And everyone's gonna have these wonderful jobs and they're gonna put so much money into the local economy. But one of the main ways you get foreign direct investment for our government is to attract it. And when you attract it, you can do a couple different things. You can say, hey, I can give you discounts on infrastructure. I can look the other way if you need to get some stuff done. I can give you massive tax breaks so that we're not gonna collect any taxes on your company. So that while I can't actually just give you money to come here, I can, not take any money when you do come here for a number of years. Now, if this sounds familiar, good, because this is something that happens domestically as well. Anytime a major employer comes in or starts shopping through towns, this is what they're doing. What little town is going to give us a ridiculous tax break? where we don't have to pay any taxes just for the privilege of us being able to be in your town. And if I can get enough of these towns competing, I can get down to where my presence is pretty darn close to a liability in these towns. Again, okay, you're giving me tax breaks for five years. Will you do six years? Back and forth and back. For. This is what Fu Yao did. And this is one of the major criticisms of Fu Yao in this film. Yes, they came in. Yes, they promised uh, uh, good paying jobs. Yes, they promised revitalization of the community. But they got a lot of stuff <laughs> from the city, from Ohio, from the US. Um, they weren't behaving in this, you know, beneficent, altruistic manner. They got a lot. Okay. Oh my gosh. I absolutely love this film for all the cultural issues. So let's put aside all the, the, the reasons why a business would go abroad. Let's put them aside all these other issues that we talk about on how we go abroad. Let's focus now on the cross-cultural uh, uh, communications issues in business because, oh boy, <laughs> we just went through a checklist on this. You know, I actually came back, I, I, I'm sitting here watching this film and I, I stopped and said, all right, I need to go back to uh, some literature that I sometimes use in a class when we start talking about this. There's a Graham and Lamb piece called The Chinese Negotiation in the 2009 issue, uh, I think the fall issue of uh, uh, the Harvard Business Review. And it outlines a number of common pitfalls. And, you know, I went through that issue uh, and I was able to check off every single one. Every one that this just film just laid out beautifully. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. I'm also gonna bring in someone called Geert Hofsted and Edward Hall. There are a couple just phenomenal anthropologists. I, I, I should, Geert Hofstede just recently passed away and Edward Hall's been passed away for a couple years. So if you'll permit me to bring in some anthropology on this as well. Um, I, I think this is uh, uh, just again, an absolutely wonderful uh, uh, way to look at things. So I'm going to start with Geert Hofstede. Now Geert Hofstede is what every anthropologist hopes they can do if they wanna earn money. You know, you go into anthropology for you know, so many great reasons, but you never go into anthropology to make a ton of money. You never hear someone say, I'm gonna be really rich, so I'm gonna be an anthropologist. Not, not typically really high up on the list. 
Geert Hofstede is the exception that proves the rule here. Geert Hofstede made a ridiculous amount of money. Uh, his speaking fees were $1 million. Um, if you want to have him speak at your conference, $1 million cash. <laughs> and he got it again and again. He was a Dutch anthropologist who worked for IBM, of all people. Now, I bring this up, and I know this is long-winded, but I want to give you the context on this. So IBM, uh, for those of you who don't know, International Business Machines, they ran a number of uh, subsidiaries, 69 different countries, uh, uh, and they had a problem. IBM found that their employees in different countries behaved differently. I know, it's a revolutionary concept, right? People behave differently. That, that's unacceptable to IBM. IBM, you, you dress in a white shirt, a thin black tie, black slacks. You don't admit things are wrong. IBM used to uh, uh, keep uh, people on the road. This was in pre-cell phone days. They would keep a special task force on the road to look for people, who uh, IBM employees who were broken down. You see, let's say you get a flat tire on your way to work. Now we all know how, to, well, let me, I may be speaking out of turn. Most of us know how to fix a flat tire, right? You, you gotta know how to get a spare tire. It's not something we want to do, but a lot of us have done this. If you're an IBM employee, you can't do that. You have to wait in your car for one of these special uh, uh, people to come up and fix your tire for you. Because IBM had a very strict dress code and they knew that if you walked out looking like you were from IBM, repairing something, that could be a brand problem for them. They didn't want anyone who was associated with IBM looking like they had to repair something because IBM worked. That's the mentality of IBM. So the idea that people in different countries behave differently just frustrated them to no ends. Now, so what did they do? Well, oh, they needed to quantify culture. Now, those two words together are enough to make probably 90% of anthropologists cry. The idea of, well, people behave differently. Everyone's just different. Like, yeah, can we put number values on those? You know, how different would you say you're feeling on a scale of one to 100? So Hofstede went, goes through and says, listen, I can do this. I need all your employees to take a thousand question questionnaire. It's gonna take them nine hours. And I need all 20,000 employees to do this. And IBM agreed. I said, yeah, all right. Everyone uh, gets the day off and has to take these surveys. He spends seven years doing this because this is in the 70s when you didn't, couldn't plug all the stuff into a computer and have it spit out the uh, information. He's using punch cards. And anyone who's seen a punch card, you, you know that this is a horrible, horrible thing. Just picture him running these punch cards day and night for seven years to get his conclusions. And he comes up with four, later five, then later six, uh, ideas of difference between uh, cultures, organizational work cultures. And he ranks everyone accordingly on this. And below, you can see the scores for China and the United States. And you can see where a lot of the problems lie. So I just wanna explore a little bit on these here. Power distance. What does power distance mean? Well, power distance is the distance between you and me. How, if I'm a lowly worker and you're the CEO, can I talk to you? Can we be friends? Or do I have to not look you in the eye, 
because a God among people is walking through and I am the dirt on your shoes. Now, in the US, you see we're at kind of a low level. Uh, it would not be uncommon for a, a junior level executive to address an executive by their first name. It's uh, uh, pretty open. Now we're not as open as say a country like Israel is, but we're pretty open on power distance. China's different. China's high on power distance. You see this when Cao interacts with the Chinese uh, uh, workers, right? There's a definite gap when we go to China, right? We see this man is on par with, you know, a god, and we workers exist to help him. Well, that's part of the problem then, too, when you see this transition to the United States is we don't have this reverence for our, staff, for our managers. They're not on this pedestal, you know, gosh, I hope we can work hard enough for them to get the fourth summer home. That's something we would resent. That's not something we would take pride in. The biggest gap here we can see is something called individualism versus collectivism. Do you take pride in individual accomplishments or do you take pride in accomplishments of the team? Oh boy. Oh boy. How many people, I, I just wanna know your reactions. When you all saw the company uh, uh, workers back in China sing their motivation in the beginning of the day. Well, let's, let's just take a minute here. Because to me, I thought, oh, I'm glad they're showing this. And then I thought, oh, man, I wonder how strange this is for someone who wasn't expecting them to burst out into song and paeans of, of loyalty to the company about how hard they're going to work on their 12-hour shift. Did, what were, what's someone's reaction to that? Or does anyone have a reaction? Or, or are we expecting it? Because I can see you might be expecting that. You knew it was going to, you knew something weird in your mind was going to come up, right? You know this wasn't going to be like, oh, I, I bet they're about the same. Can I say what I thought? <laughs> Absolutely. When I saw all of the workers just like singing this like anthem for Fuyo, it reminded me actually of like when your kids in school doing the Pledge of Allegiance. It's like just this like routine thing that they do to sort of strengthen their loyalty to some higher like force in a way. That's what it reminded me of. But it's like a business instead of a nation, which right. just makes it really interesting to think about. We don't see that, that loyalty that we is necessarily be instilled, right? In, in, in our businesses here. And in, in, we could make the argument that perhaps this, uh, this was something that occurred previously. Um, perhaps there was some sort of covenant between workers and, and uh, 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 employers that was broken in the 80s. But history doesn't necessarily even bear that one out. Uh, um, I, it, it's more of a viewing the 50s uh, through 70s employment uh, scheme through kind of rose-colored glasses. Uh, um, there was never that, you know, oh gosh, everything is, uh, well, the employer always looks out for us no matter what sort of mentality that we're really seeing here, this, this allegiance, this loyalty. And it can really be explained, I, I, I feel pretty strongly on this, on the idea that we succeed as a group in collectivism as opposed to well, what's best for us. This is a common theme and we're talking with the American workers too, right? It's not what's best for the team again and again. It's my own personal problems. I, you know, I need to get out of my sister's basement. I need to get out of, you know, I used to be making $27 an hour. Now I'm making $11 an hour and I can't afford the, the kids when they want new shoes, I can't get them. These guys weren't even, you know, they like, oh, I see my kids twice a year. 
it's the company that I'm loyal to. It's an, I, I like that it puts this in because you constantly hear when you're talking about Chinese culture, oh, Chinese culture is very family oriented. It's very family oriented, not like American uh, culture. And I like that it shows that what their, their reason for being may be family. But under this particular system, I find it very hard for people to say, oh gosh, they're family oriented. They're, it's the work family that they're work family oriented on this. Now, we'll skip over masculinity and uncertainty avoidance. The US and China are fairly close on this. I wanna get, talk about these last two points though. Pragmatism and indulgence. Now, pragmatism wasn't originally called pragmatism. It came out in, in a 1988 study with Michael Bond, and he originally termed it, lovely, the Confucian orientation. And then someone said, well, I probably can't call it Confucian orientation. He said, well, how, well what if we call it long-term versus short-term thinking? So, well, it seems like the, if you're a short-term thinking, that's more of a pejorative here. Let's, uh, let's call it pragmatism versus normatism. Uh, pragmatism is, to come up with a great term for this, is long-term thinking. <laughs> what are you, where are you going on this? Are you, are you trying to be practical? Are you trying to make long-term decisions? China is very high on this. Normatism is, well, what is best for us right now? How are the way that we've always done things? How do we fit within our current norms? And the U.S. is high on this. There's a big gap here. And you can see the way that they're planning. Fuyao is, is in it for the long haul. They're looking ahead five, 10 years. We see this repeatedly when we're talking about Chinese businesses that really are willing to take pretty strong hits in the short term. Now, if you're an American business and you say, listen, I know this will work out in 10 years, but for the next three years, we're gonna have to tighten our belts willingly and uh, have some issues. That's great. The board just replaced you. You, you. No, what are you going to deliver to shareholders this quarter? Because if you're not delivering this quarter, I, I, why are you here? Most of our executives are gonna be here five years tops, unless you're a founder. You move on fairly quickly. You don't have five, 10 year plans because we're operating on a quarterly system. There's a lot of, of gaps here. I wanna come back to the indulgence here as well uh, in a little bit. Um, one more thing here, uh, uh, and I know I'm running, a little short, so I'm going to just kind of skip over low versus high context because I want to, I want to talk about uh, um, some of these other issues as well. God, I love this wedding. Um, we end up with a couple of ideas here, and I want to hit on the idea of harmony. Harmony being so very important here, right? One of the worst things you could do in uh, uh, relations. And in the Chinese mindset, cultural mindset, is break harmony. We need to end up in a, in a consensus idea, right? We need to make sure that, oh, we're together. We're together and we're close. Even if we're not, we need to appear that we're together. Think about it this way. We've just had a major US election. If you are getting together, with family for Thanksgiving. This is what we're talking about. It's that wonderful idea where everyone looks across the table and makes a silent pledge not to talk about politics. We all know where we're at. Do we really need to bring it up now while we're eating turkey? Because if you feel that like it is time to talk about what really happened, 
you're going to break the harmony. And I don't care what happened. All the discomfort that you will feel at Thanksgiving, whether it's you, your uncle, your aunt, whoever's bringing this up, that's why it's avoided with all costs in Chinese culture. You always present harmonious relationship. Now, I would say that Fuya takes advantage of this. Look, they're right down here, people are getting married, but you know from the workers themselves, they're not gonna see a lot of each other. Someone's gonna go back to the country, raise the kids. Someone else is gonna work 12 hour shifts, 29 days a month. And you don't want to speak out. You don't want to get out on this. Why? Because harmony. Go along to get along. We've got two other things right here uh, uh, that I want to hit on both of these. Thrift and Mianzi. There's a high value of thrift. Now, does anyone, does anyone have someone who that, uh, uh, maybe a grandparent or great grandparent, or anyone can remember uh, uh, the uh, uh, someone being accused of having depression era mentality. You ever heard that term before? All right, I see. I see a couple of heads shaking here. Think back, y'all. Your grandmother who grew up in the depression, and she looks at this and goes, "You know, we can wash paper towels." You just barely use that. We can, we can rinse those out. These are, these are good paper towels. Don't just throw them away. You just wiped off the table. That can wipe off the table again. Just because the socks have holes in them doesn't mean the cloth can't be good, reused in the future. Maybe we can make a quilt out of it. We can generously say that this person is thrifty we will continue to generously say this person is thrifty until you have to clean out their house after they die and you realize hoarder is another word for it. But we'll call them thrifty for now. This is a key point in Chinese culture. It's the depression era mentality all over. And I just love that you see this again and again in the film. You see them go, you know, ah, you know, do we have to pay for this? Ah, you know, do we have to go for this? You know, look, there's a little bit of unused space right here. Why don't we put another machine in, in here? Why do we have this break room right here? You know what? Let's, let's turn this into something else. Why do we have to give them glass-proof gloves to clean up the glass? They can be careful. I... All I kept thinking about was working on my grandfather's farm, going, you know, you, you don't really need this safety equipment. You know, that, that you, you just be careful. You'll be fine. It, it, it made me smile and then made me a little bit sad watching them do this. Um, that's that value of thrift that's, that's really inherent in Chinese culture. Mianzi is the idea of saving face. For those of you who don't, aren't familiar with the term saving face, it means uh, 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 the idea that you don't want to publicly disgrace someone. You don't want to publicly call somebody out. Now, if you have something to say, you do it quietly, you do it behind closed doors, and you don't do it in the presence of other people. If you call them out publicly, you're shaming them. Now, shaming is something that is quite common in America, right? We don't like what your company's doing, we'll shame you. That's, that's how Americans operate. And that's how to completely ruin a relationship with a Chinese company. What are we doing uh, repeatedly throughout this film? Every time Fuya does something, well, they shame them. You see the look on his face when uh, uh, Sherrod Brown comes up and starts advocating for unions. You see the deep hatred that just shows up? 
Now, I'm not talking about Dave, who's wishy-washy uh, throughout the film. And I love that he's so hard, so vulgar with the, about Sherrod Brown uh, uh, in, the, in the film. And then ultimately his final words are, yeah, yeah maybe they need a union. <laughs> Oh, it just made me, uh, oh man, that was great. <laughs> but, but if you watch Cal, you see his face just harden because here is his moment of triumph. They're opening up the, the film. Uh, they're opening up the plant. The weather is perfect, just like he said it was going to be. Again, he's, he has godlike status. He can predict the weather and you better believe that things are going to go his way. And then here's this guy who's advocating for something that he doesn't want on his special day. This is like your little brother getting a bigger scoop of ice cream on your birthday. That's not right. And you watch his face. If you watch this movie again, you see him, you see him get mad. And part of the reason why uh, Dave, I'm convinced that part of the reason why Dave is so upset is because he noticed it too. He noticed the problem that was going to, uh, that was starting to occur. And he knew this was the beginning of the end for the American management team at Fuya. Okay, last little part on this here. Because these are absolutely wonderful parts that come into the film. So there's something called endurance or eating bitterness. That's a very high cultural value in China. It's the idea of how much can you take we can work 12 hour days, we can work them. We don't, we only need one day off. You see the pride, right? The pride and the suffering. Look at how soft the Americans are with their eight hour days and their weekends. Look at how soft they are, not being able to stand 200 degrees and horrible working conditions. They got up because their workstation was on fire? Come on. Eating bitterness. The fact that we can take it. There's a lot of pride in there, and that's a major cultural point in China. We can take it. We also see, I mentioned hierarchy before, but the role of labor. I love the contrast in labor unions. How many, how many other people were expect, just, just saw this as utter hypocrisy? right, between the Chinese labor union and the American labor union, what they were offering. Was anyone expecting something different? Or did this seem just kind of par for the course? What do you think? You know, with the Chinese labor union, right, you have, first off, it's his brother-in-law who's the head of the Chinese labor union, who also happens to be a party official. Now you see party officials, again, moving very closely into uh, 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 these workplaces. And I love that it's a communist party official. Like, you think a communist party official in charge of, of a labor union, boy, that just fits into every stereotype that uh, uh, imaginable for the Americans, right? Oh, of course, it's a, a, communi a commie in charge of the uh, labor union. They're all commies. But here we have an actual card-carrying, legitimate communist in charge of the labor union. And what's the labor union doing for the workers? Getting them to work harder and to shut up about the working conditions. No, the labor union isn't there for the, the workers. The labor union is there to make sure they work hard and they don't get out of line for the business. And this is oftentimes, this is a very common role of labor unions, particularly in China. You're not there to protect. And we contrast this, right? The whole American labor unions who are, are there with an antagonistic relationship with management. They're not there to keep the workers in line, they're there to try to advocate for the workers. And that's, that's unacceptable. That's, that's like having your management work against you to the Chinese. This is an alien concept. And to have someone who's 
not working for the betterment of the company. Now, I would also take issue with the idea of do our labor unions working for the betterment of the company or not, but in their mind, not working for the betterment of the company, the overt betterment of the company, well, why do we want these people in here at all? They take a very strong stance against labor unions, despite the fact that nominally, ideologically, they should be much more adept to the idea of the workers uh, uh, having rights and the workers uh, uh, possessing more equality with the management. Instead, they're even further away than, than where you would expect the Americans to be in some sort of weird funhouse mirror man, uh, manner. So I have gone on a long time on this. And I just, I, 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 these were the three thoughts that I just kept coming back to. How wonderful this portrays foreign direct investment into the United States. How wonderful this portrays cultural misunderstandings that are inherent here. And also, you know, just so I don't end on such a bummer, I loved the innate humanity that, it, that we're able to show. One of the things that took this from being an interesting documentary for me into being just something that was really noteworthy was the fact that both the directors through work with Chinese collaborators were able to get the Chinese workers stories, that they were able to get the Chinese management on film and talking so openly about one of the things that they were feeling, not just, you know, the, the dollars and cents, but their frustrations, their pain at being away from their family. Some of the uh, problems and misunderstandings that they personally had and just the little joys in their life. I was on here earlier before we started recording saying, well, one of my favorite parts was uh, uh, the worker who took them out and let them ride his Harley and shoot guns, you know, America. I also love the idea here that these guys just wanted to fish. And, you know, at, as a fisherman, somewhat of a fisherman, I love that they were fishing for carp too. Now, I've caught a carp before and immediately went, oh man, I didn't mean to get this. Why, why is it even going? You know, carp are horrible, horrible fish. I've never eaten a carp. I never intend to eat a carp. I, I think my uncle cooked one up as a joke just to talk about how horrible it was. I saw it cooking. I'm like, this is the boniest, nastiest smelling fish I've ever seen. Which is wonderful because carp is considered a delicacy in Chinese food. This is a, a, a fish that you eat. This is an important fish. It's not it's trash fish like bass or perch here. They're fishing, they're even fishing for a different fish. The only reason people in the United States have carp in their ponds and have carp in their, in their uh, 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 lakes is to eat the algae out. We don't want to actually eat these things. And yet, even in this moment of shared humanity, we're still going after different things. I just, I, I thought that was a wonderful illustration. So I have rambled and talked about my thoughts quite a bit. I just want to hear some of your thoughts on uh, or on the presentation. I'll do my best to talk about this. I'll end it here. Let me move off and stop sharing my screen um, so we can all see each other. Yeah, Emily, did you have right. Let's see. One, first of all, amazing presentation. <laughs> Thanks. Secondly, I wanted to bring up at the very end of the documentary, they mentioned automation and how like right as they were wrapping up filming the documentary that started becoming an issue. Yep. I was wondering like, do we know what they are going to do about that? Like, are they going to lose workers? Are they going to bring people on to work the robots? Are they going to train their workers to use those robots? because there are a lot of different things they could do that will completely change just the sort of dynamic in that factory 
and I've just been thinking about that since I saw it. One of the biggest problems that I have doing kind of PR for global business, right? Very often, global business is a great punching bank. Well, we're losing all of our good jobs because they're going somewhere else. Not, not really. A lot of manufacturing, if you look at the, the GDP, a lot of manufacturing still exists in the United States. A relatively, a surprisingly uh, small percentage goes overseas in contract manufacturing. We're under the impression that given the job loss in manufacturing, oh gosh, well, all of this just went to Mexico and China and elsewhere. Yeah, some of it did. Some of the really cheap stuff did. But automation is what's killing it. This is, we, we look at job losses, that's what's killing it. That's where, where we're going. It's the, uh, anywhere from unskilled to semi-skilled uh, uh, laborers in factories who are, who are not going to find uh, uh, work on this because automation is moving through this. Right now, I was, just today, I was thrilled at looking at, uh, um, anyone familiar with PlayStation 5? Maybe, a little bit, okay. The factory that's being made in that, everyone assumes it's coming from uh, China. It's not, it's coming from Japan. And the Japanese factory that produces one PlayStation 5 every 30 seconds is nearly entirely automated with some sources saying between four and 24 employees in the entire factory. Now, to put this in other terms, uh, let's go back to what McDonald's did in Germany. McDonald's has a, uh, uh, gosh, this was 20 years ago, where they had a fully automated uh, uh, McDonald's. So it had zero, sort of, zero actual employees. The entire thing was automated. There was one employee who was in charge of the automation. Now that employee made good money. And we're pretty far from minimum wage, pretty far from $15 an hour. But there was one guy. These highly skilled manufacturing workers are the people who are very versed in robotics, very versed in technology, very versed in the ability to program these. We're talking about, if you're, we're talking about manufacturing jobs, there are still gonna be manufacturing jobs. There's gonna be a much smaller segment. And these are gonna be very skilled workers. Um, did that answer your question? I'm sorry, I kind of went off. Did I, did I get it all or was that, yeah, wanna follow kind of, up? It was, it was just kind of like putting it out there, just like, what do we think would happen in that case? And I, I guess it kind of does. They would probably lose workers, maybe train some to work in automation. Cause we've even, yeah, we've seen, uh, um, so I was looking, I was looking some stuff up about the FUYO uh, today and we've seen just massive layoffs out of there. They've, they've automated. Now they've not automated to the extent of like Sony's plant for PlayStation 5 or, you know, some of these, completely automated places. But yeah, they've, they shed workers um, because they don't, they don't need these workers. These, these machines don't go on strikes. Machines. But, but they don't sing for, company songs either. What? But they don't sing company songs either. So how do they you don't swear sing. that <laughs> culturally? It's a problem. And it's also one of the reasons why I think you're going to see problematic workers disappear first. They're doing this in the United States. They weren't doing this in China. The Chinese workers behave more like robots for them. They behave like they expect them to. It's the American workers who are gonna be, be replaced first. You're right, they don't, they don't issue these. It, it becomes a certain amount of, do we need this kind of pump up? Do we need this cultural uh, uh, love? Um, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah. One, yeah, Emily, sorry. 
Sorry, I was going to say Ooh. just, um, I know with GM, they've already started doing a lot of automation because my dad works for GM specifically in the in the automated area where they paint the cars because he used to work for Chrysler back in like 2008 yeah and like I mean got laid off in the recession but mm -hmm. he painted the cars then by hand with like the spray paint stuff mm -hmm. and when he got hired on to GM he's essentially working in the same department just it's now automated so he's mm -hmm making sure the robots are doing his job correctly. Right. <laughs> Which and is another thing that they could be doing <laughs> at Fuyao. Well, yeah. And, and you end up with, again, probably less workers, but the workers they have have much higher skill. Um, because I, instead of just painting the cars, he has to supervise robots that are doing this. He's effectively a supervisor, it sounds like. It just yeah, made pretty much living people. <laughs> um, and, and the ability to work with robotics is a real skill that we're seeing that's very important. Um, as, as these robots, and as this automation, again, continues to eat into our manufacturing. Um, and when I hear people talk about manufacturing and, and trying to maintain the manufacturing jobs that we have, I always come back to, well, I hope, gosh, I, I hope they're getting trained in automation because that's the way to do it. Robin? Did you... Yeah, I, I wanted to just, I had two points I wanted to bring up. One, um, really kind of related to um, the notion of that Pledge of Allegiance and sort of that kind of really baked in loyalty type thing. Right. You know, but, you know, here we are talking about management principles here and how to build a team, how to, you know, we, we, we strive to, to build trust, to build loyalty, you know, um, you know, create an environment in which, you know, um, employees feel um, mm -hmm. a connection with the institution. We know that connection means retention of really qualified, you know, employees. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, when I was watching, I was trying to think about, you know, where, you know, where is that line, you know, um, from the point where that loyalty just seemed so almost unnatural in a way from an American point of view versus that's not the kind of loyalty that we're trying to build or I try to build with, with you know. Well, so it's a real interesting difference to, to see that. And I, you know, I, I'm sorry if I'm beating a dead horse with this, but could you ever imagine having a group wedding in your factory? That the idea of pledging loyalty to that extreme, you know, let me get married in the company picnic with other people who are getting married in the company picnic. <laughs> I, 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 listen, I've had jobs I loved. I love my current job. I, I, I'm not getting married at Lindenwood. Um, you know, Lee, I know you love East Central. I, I don't think you and Andy ever consider, you know, let, let's get married in the theater. Like, I, I, that's, that's, that's creepy, right? <laughs> we, we wouldn't consider that as loyalty. We consider that like, you, you need psychological help. Uh, Unless we build like a venue, like an event venue. Yeah, I don't know. There's a little tasteful chapel. <laughs> maybe we could do that. Starts to spend, diversify revenue. I mean, I don't know. Um, so, my other my other point was um, that really kind of set the stage is when the opening, not the, the opening scene, but like a few minutes into it, um, when they were looking over the city um, of Dayton, and, and you're like, this, you know, to me was. Like from their perspective, this was something different than what I, because I've been there. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, okay, it's nice, um, but it's, you know. Uh, so anyway, that was, I just knew, that, I just knew that I would learn something from the the film, which I did, you know, in terms of perspective. And I think that was the whole point of, and even learning and watching our own at our college right now, obviously during International Education Week, learning pers some perspective from our international students that we take for granted. 
Here. I'm constantly learning from our international students too. I, I we, uh, uh, both how things from an outsider's point of view and some of the, their uh, necessarily uh, opinions on both whether things are easy or whether things are hard. We have a number of students from Honduras, for example, and it's always interesting getting their opinions on this. Uh, um, some of them have some real difficulty uh, uh, moving forward and adapting to the United States. It's, it's rough in some regard. Yeah, no, this is great. Yeah. Um, Can I ask, or say yeah. something, I guess, thinking about the, the loyalty and the, the difference. I, for years, I wrote, um, I interviewed and wrote feature articles of people who'd been um, celebrating like 30 years at a local mm -hmm. factory. Um, and over the years, you know, I would hear the same message from individuals every time that if you could get on here after high school or trade school, it, your life was set. And yep. it was like a family and using language of loyalty, but it was very different than what we see in the Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. um, the the plant or the company was bought out by an international company and people basically stopped wanting to do interviews or would say more frequently don't write this it just feels different but mm -hmm. my point in thinking about the family language how i think that probably in american institutions that's what we aim for this idea of in the past that maybe it felt like a family but when we use that language oftentimes families aren't harmonious that still perhaps 30, 40 years ago, there was a sense of being able to disagree and especially if there was labor unions involved, that close power distance. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I, I like the idea, you, you say families aren't harmonious. And yes, but. So picture more an idea of the family that has major problems. We all have major problems. But the last thing, the, the, the cardinal sin of the family is to mention those major problems. Let's be nice. Let's talk about things. Let's talk about sports. Let's talk about the weather. Let's not, not bring up the huge underlying issues that no one talks about and no one will talk about. Because if you're the one to bring up that issue, suddenly you're the bad guy. Suddenly you're the problem with the family. If, if Uncle Ben has a drinking problem, we're all gonna ignore it. But if you're the person who says, gosh, we should do something about Uncle Ben, the issue isn't Uncle Ben, the issue is you. That's the harmony that we're talking about. Now, can we fix Uncle Ben's deep drinking problem? Yeah, but this goes into the whole idea of Miancy as well. Listen, you can talk privately to Uncle Ben, you can talk privately to family members. You can say, gosh, you know, uh, uh, Grandpa, Uncle Ben isn't doing so well. Do you think you might be able to do something with him when it's just me and Grandpa? And we can move this out quietly. We won't cause a big scene. Either Uncle Ben gets fixed or doesn't get fixed and he comes back and nothing happened. We're not going to mention where Uncle Ben was for two years. Everything's fine, everything's harmonious. Even when there was real problems here. And that's really the idea of harmony. It's the appearance of harmony. It's the appearance of maintaining face, saving face here uh, through harmony. And, and that's, that's part of the problem throughout this whole film. They just want happy workers. They want happy workers singing. And they do not do well when the workers stop singing. And, and start asking for things, um, particularly when they start asking for things in the public setting. That's, I, I'm convinced looking at that, well, the labor union, labor unions in the United States, we, you know, the reason why you join a union, stand up for your rights, stand up, be heard, talk about these things and confront people. And confrontation is not going to work here. Uh, confrontation is going to cause them to dig their heels in and go, you know, oh my gosh, you're behaving in as most disrespectful a manner as possible. Why would we deal with someone who is doing the equivalent of shouting obscenities at us? 
and they moved on. Um, I, you know, I, I love the fact that they got him on camera saying, if we go, if they unionize, I'll just close it all down. I have heard so many managers say the exact same thing, not on camera, because that's illegal to say, but use those threats in union negotiations uh, uh, of, hey, you know, I don't have to have this factory if it, go, if it goes union. He went straight there. This wasn't after long, lengthy union negotiations. This is a, just the mere thought of unions of unionization happening, and here he is going right for the right for the you know the standard line. I love that they brought in a union buster uh, and made people attend these sessions two, three times before the union vote. Um, I've seen that. I've worked at places that have brought those union busters in. Uh, it's, it's interesting. The scene with the chairman toward the end, because um, I like to teach this um, for rhetorical analysis. Like I don't mm -hmm. know any of the things that you know, and I've learned a lot tonight, but just so teaching it like as a text well. and how um, the central argument and actually, Emily, can I pick on you to say what you, the central argument was in your own words? Or if you can kind of remember what you said. What specific part were you mentioning? The overall film, like the overall film argument. <laughs> Did you not memorize what you wrote? <laughs> I have no all pressure, of my notes no right pressure. here, actually. Just, <laughs> just the idea that it's more complicated than we think and that and you brought up the no yeah at the end that really like we're have you know we're kind of chasing each other about these issues but then it's actually automation but um the the chairman at the end when he has this really introspective moment about how it's kind of beautiful from, yeah it's oh my gosh the 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 honesty uh and introspection I, I'm sorry to cut you off on that, Lee, no. but that was one of the most beautiful parts of the whole film. Am, am I a good guy? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, did I do this? I, I, I almost thought when I was watching that, I'm like, surely this is manufactured because no one in that position is going to be just that, that unguarded. <laughs> right. Anyway, sorry, go on, go on, Lee. No, sorry. but you're exactly right. And then the last thing he says is, well, the purpose of life is to work. So right. just this deep introspection and then pulling back and saying, no, this is right. This is right, yeah. And we had some good conversations in class about like, how do we, if, if we say we want that level of productivity and kind of work, we as Americans aren't, that's not us. And the individualism, we talk a lot about that. So there's a really interesting thing happening right now in Europe, and they're they're trying to um, actually get uh, uh, they've actually approached the incoming administration on this as well. Um, it's the push for the four day work week, and the idea here is that we have seen companies that go to a four day you know four day work week with three days off um, actually not lose much in the way of productivity because people their workers are better rested they're more willing to be productive while they're working and that automation should actually help people's working we should be seeing a decline in total working hours as we incorporate more of our skills in into this and incorporate more of our technology into helping us do our jobs and so specifically for white collar work for you know uh 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 work that is outside of a service industry sort of jobs, that this should be a four day work week. And, uh, and uh, uh, um, we should also be seeing this again, where I was mentioning here in specific manufacturing as well, because we will end up with fewer, uh, again, this is according to the people who are advocating for this, we will end up with fewer workplace injuries and fewer uh, um, more productive workers on the line if they're better rested and have more free time. They're more, they would be more willing to work 
in four days, four days, eight hour shift, 32 hours a week, and to then see a bump uh, uh, so that everyone's pay may, uh, maintains the same. So uh, re refigure everyone's hourly rate to cover uh, more or less what they would normally be making. Uh, uh, bump, give them a 20% bump in other words. And they point to a lot of different areas, but as I'm, as I'm looking at, at this, and as I was, I was listening to this and then reading up on this, I couldn't help but contrast that, you know, this, this European approach, this European push with how foreign that would seem on the other end out of this film where, you know, I think Americans are soft here. Can you imagine them then being said, well, actually a four day work week would even work better. Four day, four days at eight hours. Um, you know, I, I, I think they may have had, all had heart attacks right then if that had been suggested. Um, but, you know, they, they look at the Americans like they're just insane for wanting to have a life outside of work. You know, the, what you said, you know, exactly what with, with the chairman, you know, life, the purpose of life is work. And then to, again, have someone again over here in Europe and saying, well, we need to pull back from work even more, that work is something that we do in addition, but it's not necessarily who we are, and that we will work more efficiently if we have more time to be who we are. The Chinese workers didn't even know who they were, who they were was their their position they were going to work themselves to death uh, um and happily yeah is there any evidence on what I, I would call cultural evolution the chinese workers you you mentioned how they went to that gentleman's farm and rode his harley and shot his guns and the longer they're here seeing the the benefits of having spare time over time, are they going to begin to want to have that spare time and draw back from this, this work ethic? Well, one of the big ways that we can actually talk about that, if we're talking about, uh, um, this is one of the things that probably the Chinese company is actually scared of here. Um, let's talk about the idea of cultural uh, uh, um, acquisition. Uh, it's a, uh, Sorry, to, I keep bringing up anthropologists. This is something from John Barry. Um, and the idea of um, uh, cultural uh, uh, acquisition where we start to, an uh, acclimatization where we start to bring in elements of other cultures. So to put it in, in really terms, if, if you have ever had a friend who went on vacation to England and came back with a hint of a British accent, they're really trying to get you to hear. Something like that, you know, wherever you go, whatever culture you're part of, you're going to acclimate to the parts that you like. And man, I love, uh, uh, to your point here, we see that with, uh, um, and forgive me, I'm, I'm losing his name. It was uh, 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 the Chinese worker who brought his family in the end. You saw that he saw the American workers who were really more engaged with their families and made it a priority to, he was living with his family at the end. Arguably, probably in a much better life than he had back in China, where he wasn't living with his family, where he saw them, you know, rarely, if ever. And so I think you're absolutely going to see that uh, um, as, as people move on. We see that, uh, um, we definitely have uh, uh, seen evidence for, um, movement in culture and acclimatization to culture. Uh, probably most recently we can showcase um, uh, uh, consumer culture in say South Korea um, in, in kind of the same way. Uh, South Korea, even as late as kind of the uh, early 80s, you know, this was back when South Korea had uh, more of an authoritarian dictatorship and the wages were very, very low in South Korea. The whole uh, uh, reason to be was just as an existence for, uh, um, in opposition to North Korea. This was a, a state that was more or less supported by a few chebols, the large corporations that were very connected to the government, corporations that still exist, by the way, like Hyundai and Samsung. Um, 
and uh, uh, were supported very much through uh, um, what we would call uh, state partnerships. The, the workers were very, very poor. They worked very, very hard. And one of the major parts of uh, our reasons why the government was able to stay afloat was just uh, infusions from the United States government and the military bases themselves helped support South Korea. That wasn't that long ago, relatively speaking. Um, you know, that 40, 45 years ago. Now, through again, we can say uh, continued exposure to American culture, but also to continued exposure to Japanese culture, which in turn was shaped through also con uh, exposure to Japan uh, American culture back in the uh, 40s and 50s. Uh, we can see that well, Korean culture seems much closer to American culture than it would to say the Chinese culture of the time. Um, there is a consumer culture. Now, is it different than the United States? Absolutely, they've taken their own thing. They've done done their own thing. Uh, um, you know, I, I'm two days ago. My daughters were listening to BTS, and and Lord, that's going to be very different than anything we have here. If you're not familiar with BTS, look them up. It'll um, yep, um. Yup, let's go to the stadium. Um, so it's very unique, but it's so evolved from where they were. They they really radically changed. And I think that if we start getting into kind of the geopolitics of it, that's one of the things that frightens uh, uh, the Chinese so much is that when we start opening up freedoms when we start opening up the idea of moving forward and having greater access to the, you know, do I have a freedom to not be part of the company? Do I have a freedom to consume how I like to consume, to, to move how I like to, to, to move, to be in situations where I can support myself and my own individual interests outside of being part of this company machine or the state machine, as it was kind of before, what does that then do to my loyalty to the company, my loyalty to the state? And so we see a lot of pullback uh, from the government in China, trying to enjoy the benefits uh, that, they, that they get, uh, you know, people like Cao get uh, from running Fuyao while not necessarily getting a lot of extra from the workers themselves. Um, they're scared of that. They, they know they've, China has undergone an urbanization process that we really haven't seen uh, uh, in, the, in, in our history. Uh, we have seen an a immigration to the cities over the past, uh, uh, China used to be 80% rural, 20% urban, and that has flipped since 1985. So in 35 years, we went from 2080 to 8020. All those people flooded into the cities. And what could have happened, what the Chinese government was most worried about was that they were all gonna come in and they wouldn't have jobs and you would have throngs and throngs of people on the streets brooding in discontent. So the number one goal of the party was to find jobs for all of these people, keep them fed, keep them housed, and keep them off the streets. Because if they're on the streets, they're not happy, they're not busy. And when people are not happy and not busy, that can cause a problem. Well, now they're all employed, but as you mentioned here, as John mentioned, Automation's coming here. What's going to happen to the Chinese workers when automation happens? What happens when these factory jobs start getting replaced? Am I going to keep all these workers in place to keep them employed, to keep them off the streets? At what point does the party come in and say, listen, I know automation is better, but you have to keep these people employed if you want to be in a, in a favorable situation with the government? One thing I skipped over in my presentation was the concept of guanxi. 
Guangxi is this uh, uh, kind of social capital relationship that uh, businesses work with each other and with the government. It's this, uh, for lack of a better uh, term, it's the good old boy network uh, writ large across China. And if I'm automating my plant, I'm basically committing the equivalent of firing everybody's nephew. And now everyone's going to come from me. All of a sudden, my deliveries aren't going to get there on time. My electricity is going to get turned off uh, at inopportune moments. My tax, I'm going to find out that I'm going to get audited every single year. He is, uh, you know, he's a billionaire. He's very wealthy. But he still exists in a society that's going to have a lot of power over him. If his brother-in-law wants to make problems for him because he's making problems for the party, that can absolutely happen. Sorry, that was a little wide-ranging. It's all fascinating. I'm, I'm conscientious of the time, but does anyone else, any other questions or thoughts? Well, thank you all for coming out. I really thank appreciate you it. so much, Dr. Koble. Um, I learned a lot tonight, so thank you. Sorry if I ran on too much. No, very good. It was very good. Thank you. Wonderful. It's good seeing you all. And Dr. Koble, I should have mentioned in your bio, you are partially via dual credit. You know, you're an alum yep. of ECC. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. I went to uh, I went to Union High School. I did a couple dual credit classes, three East Central. I've been on East Central's campus for competitions growing up. Yep. So we can, you know, I just wanted to stamp that on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you East so much. I love East Central. You're just um, all right. It. So I guess we will wrap up for the evening. Thank okay. you again for if being here. Thank you. Anyone has any questions or wants to talk uh, while it's still recording, feel free. You can always email me. Uh, Dr. Cole or uh, uh, um, anyone will, can be able to, to give you my email here on this and uh, uh, if you don't have it it's just kcoble at lindenwood.edu if you are viewing this on a recording or you know, if something comes up feel free to email me I'm, I'll be as responsive as I can thank Sorry. you so much thank, thank you. you have a wonderful evening everyone Bye.